So it's great to be here, um, and it's great to see so many high school students here, uh, and you're getting sort of this raw primary introduction to one of the biggest issues that we are dealing with here in this country and abroad. So welcome, it's, it's great to be part of this wonderful program, Global Minnesota. Uh, you know, coming to Minnesota to talk about immigration allows me to make this a more personal story for me than it would have otherwise been. As Tom said, I have Minnesota roots, my family is still here. This is where my own immigrant forebears settled. Like many that arrived in those years to this region, they came from Norway, and I'm gonna start with that story. It's a story I used to open my book, actually. Um, I don't usually begin talks like this with my own immigrant connection, but being here in a land that's largely of Scandinavian ancestry, I'm guessing this is a story some of you can relate to as well from your own histories. So in my case, it begins in a lovely little, lovely little village called Ardal on the edge of the Sonnefjord, which is famous around the world for its beauty. There was a family farm uh, in that village at the base of a mountain. The farm had been in the family since the middle 1700s. It passed from father to firstborn son. Now Norway had what was called a primogeniture law, which meant that a farm could only pass to one heir. Uh, and it had to be, or the firstborn son had the first right to inherit the farm. The idea was uh, twofold. First, to guarantee family ownership of Norway's farmland, but also to guarantee that the land would not be broken up, which was the idea that you could only pass it to one heir. Of course, that meant if you weren't the firstborn son, you were probably out of luck. So in 1864, the farm was due to pass to a young man named Johannes. Uh, he was 22 years old, uh, but he was restless. And the prospect of following the predictable path of his father and grandfather and great-grandfather was not all that enticing. I mean, the farming life in Ardal was not easy. The winter was long and dark and cold. And to stay in Ardal would be to settle for the narrow world of the Norwegian peasantry. Uh, but Johannes, unlike his forebears, had a choice. The talk in rural Norway in those days was of going to America, a land wide open to immigrants. For the equivalent of about $30, Transport companies were offering special America packages uh, that covered steamship travel across the ocean and then rail transport into the U.S. interior. Norway in those days, in the middle to late 1800s, had one of the highest rates of population growth in the world, uh, but still had a pre-industrial agrarian economy that offered few employment opportunities. More than two-thirds of the population lived in rural areas, and many of them, the majority of them, were landless. But here in Minnesota, and in Wisconsin, and in the Dakota Territory, large tracts of tillable land were empty. Johannes and his young bride left Ardal to seek a new life in America. The, the farm passed to another brother. But there were two more boys in the family, Samuel and Ole, and like so many other young Norwegian men, uh, they had few prospects at home. And after a few years, they followed their brother, Johannes, to America. So in each decade, from 1860 to 1910, Norway lost about 5% of its population to emigration. Only Italy and Ireland lost more. Samuel and Ole made their way here to Minnesota, where Johannes had settled. Uh, once they arrived here, Johannes helped them get uh, work as uh, laborers, farm laborers. During the winter, they went to a little country school. They sat uh, alongside you know, eight and nine-year-olds to learn English. Uh, after they had saved enough money to buy some oxen and a wagon, they made their way farther west until they came to land that had not yet been claimed. For their first shelter, they turned their wagon box upside down put it on four posts and, and, and laid canvas over the top uh, as a roof. Uh, later on, they built a rudimentary log cabin with the roof made of bark and sod, just as was done back in Norway. They threw themselves into their farming, cultivating wheat, oats, and potatoes. They were pious Lutheran men, not given to frivolity. They worked hard. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Don't you? <laughs> and in time, they prospered. They did come to see themselves as Americans, but it was not hard. No one marginalized them as newcomers or challenged their 
loyalties or identity as, or religion. As pioneers, they took that part of America as their own and no one questioned their claim. Meanwhile, back in Norway, the emigration continued. In the next generation, the farm in Ardal passed to another a young man, the oldest son, and again, a younger son was left with no prospects. He too made his way to America, following his uncles, Johannes, Samuel, and Ole. His name was Nikolai, and he was my grandfather. So I opened my book with that story uh, because I think it's important. And here's the question I think it raises. What's the difference really between the immigration experience of my Norwegian relatives, including my grandfather Nikolai, and the immigration experiences of people arriving these days from Central America, or for that matter, from North Africa, as you saw from Tom Hansen's uh, presentation, who right now are making their way across the Mediterranean to Europe. In all these cases, what drove them to leave their homelands was a sense that there was no longer opportunity there, that the opportunities were elsewhere, so they were motivated to move. Uh, my grandfather didn't get permission to move to America. He didn't have a visa. He just came following the path that his uncles had taken. He was 20 years old. He did not speak English. He had no promise of a job waiting for him here. In all those respects, uh, his case was not all that different from the young men or women from Central America or North, or North Africa who had had off looking for a better life. Of course, there was one big difference. He was a white man from Scandinavia. At the time he passed through Ellis Island, about 1900, there was a lot of debate in the country about which immigrants we should allow into the country. As the historian Aristide Zolberg wrote, uh, we were at the time a nation of immigrants, but not just any immigrants. <coughs> at the time my grandfather came, Chinese were excluded. Fortunately for him and for his uncles, Norwegians were considered good immigrants. You know, at the time my grandfather arrived in this country, there was an organization in the United States called the Immigration Restriction League. And it was founded by a Harvard-trained lawyer named Prescott Hall, who at the time of its founding posed what he said was the crucial immigrant question. Do we want this country to be peopled by British, German, and Scandinavian stock, historically free, energetic, progressive, or by Slav, Slav, Latin, and Asiatic races, historically downtrodden, atavistic, and stagnant. A few years after my grandfather arrived, the US Congress established a Federal Immigration Commission to investigate who exactly was coming into the country and what <coughs> strengths or deficiencies they brought with them. The commission did a lot of investigation. They came up with a 42-volume final report <laughs> that officially defined which ethnicities were desirable and which were undesirable. The Slavs, according to the commission, displayed fanaticism in religion, carelessness as to the business virtues of punctuality and often honesty. The Italians, <laughs> the Italians were found to be excitable, impulsive, and highly imaginative, but also impractical. <laughs> the Scandinavians, according to the government commission, of all the ethnicities investigated were found to be, quote, the purest type. <laughs> so Grandpa Nikolai had that going for him. Uh, you know, jumping to the present day, a lot of commentators these days uh, who think, do think there's too much immigration in the country, too many immigrants. Of course, the fallacy in their argument is that except for Native Americans and African Americans, we're all immigrants uh, or the offspring of immigrants. So, you know, how do these people get off by saying uh, we have too many immigrants? Well, Ann Coulter, who's one of the most prominent uh, in this camp, one of the most prominent anti-immigrant voices around today, has an answer for that. She says her ancestors were not actually immigrants. They were settlers. <laughs> the difference being that they came to an empty country, a country that needed newcomers to till the fields and build roads and work in factories. No one was here. They settled here. And they didn't take jobs away from people who were already here. You know, and, and I suppose my grandfather could have said that as well, because he and his uncles moved to a part of the country that was not very 
widely populated, and they were able to take it over and make something of themselves. So there is something to that argument. But here's what I think. I have to wonder whether my grandfather uh, would have been deterred from coming to this country if he had known that he was going to displace some worker who was already here. If he knew there was opportunity here beyond what there was in Norway, would he not have come anyway? Like the Central Americans and the North Africans, he was driven in the first place by need. And as Tom Hansen so eloquently explained, there has been migration as a part of human history for a million years. Humans have always moved from one place to another, driven by need. Border controls can complicate migration, but the drive to move is deep and powerful. There's war, there's religious violence. The same factors that have driven migration for hundreds of years, thousands of years, uh, will be with us continually. So here in the United States, as long as we are seen as a land of opportunity, dealing with immigration is a challenge we're going to have to face no matter the circumstances, no matter who's in charge of the government. So in my book, I raise this question of how are we actually doing? Uh, we were late uh, in demonstrating uh, our capacity, our capability in, in this regard. It took us 200 years to put one of our founding promises into practice. You know, George Washington said, the bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respectable stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions. This was George Washington speaking in 1782. John Quincy Adams said, talking about Americans, said Americans look forward to their posterity rather than backward to their ancestors. So that was the idea of America. That was the promise of, of America. But it was only with the passage in 1965, 200 years after America's founding, that that promise was actually kept or that the first significant move was made to keep that promise. Uh, that law about abolished the national origin quota system, which had been used to limit US immigration largely to white Europeans, northern Europeans to be more precise. Under that national quota system, countries like Germany and Britain and other northern European countries were allocated tens of thousands of immigrant visas each year, while the countries of Asia and Africa were given just 100 visas each per year. After 1965, all nationalities were to be treated on a more or less equal basis. And for the first time in American history, immigrants of color were to be given the same basic treatment as white European immigrants. The consequences of that legislation were dramatic. And I have two charts here that show the change in pretty dramatic terms. The first one shows the percentage of the US population that was born outside the country. Now, shortly after my grandparents came, uh, around 1905, uh, you saw about 14, <coughs> close to 15% of the US population were immigrants born outside of the United States. That, pop, that proportion, that was around, then shortly after that, the national origin quota system was put in place. You see that proportion going down, 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 largely because of these restrictive quotas that kept almost all Asians, Africans, and Middle Easterners out of the country. Then, suddenly, it starts turning back up again. When? Just after 1965. Now, the second chart, to me, is even more dramatic. This shows the national origin of our immigrant population. The blue line indicates the, the percentage of immigrants who are coming from Europe. The red line indicates the percentage of immigrants who are coming from outside Europe, anywhere besides Europe. So you see that starts going down. It goes down for very logical reasons, uh, because the urge to the, the push factors, as Tom was talking about, in Europe were becoming weaker and weaker. There was less and less reason to migrate uh, out of Europe. So the number of European immigrants goes down, down, down. Meanwhile, uh, after the number of immigrants coming from outside Europe, is at a very low level for a long time because of these quotas, but all of a sudden it starts going way up. And when do those two lines cross? It was at the same point that you saw in the previous chart, around 1965, 
with the passage of the 1965 Act. You know, the 1965 Act, as you can imagine, was controversial in its time. Uh, the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we've seen in this year's presidential campaign does not even compare it to what was said during the debate over the 1965 Act. You add, for example, the president of the Daughters of the American Revolution testifying in Congress saying that if we were allow, if we were to allow all these non-European immigrants to come into the country, there would be a collapse of moral and spiritual values because non-assimilable aliens of dissimilar ethnic background and culture would be permitted gradually to overwhelm our country. This, this idea that some immigrant groups uh, assimilate to US culture more easily than others was the main argument behind those who were opposed to the 1965 Act, and we still hear that today, as I'm gonna to get to in a minute. Um, but, um, so in my book, I say that the 1965 Act brought out uh, this situation where our promise, this notion of ourselves as an open country where everyone could get a new start regardless of their background, only after 1965 did we really dare to put this proposition to a test? Did we really dare to sort of live out that promise? Uh, finally, we started letting in a far more diverse immigrant population in numbers that had never previously been allowed. And we have seen whether the nation can handle diversity. And I've argued, and the main point of my book is that I argue that we have largely demonstrated resiliency. In more ways than not, we have proven that we are capable of pluralism. Arguably to me, and I lived in Europe for several years, to a greater extent than Europe, for example. Now, that's not to understate the challenges this new, more diverse immigration has presented, both economically and culturally. Uh, in this campaign especially, we've often heard the charge that a high level of immigration is hurting native-born American workers. Um, we, we hear that with respect to those immigrants who are coming here outside the law, but it does not end there. Uh, Donald Trump and others have argued that we also need to reduce legal immigration. Uh, I want to quote from the, uh, Donald Trump's main immigration speech, the one that he delivered in Phoenix immediately after meeting in Mexico with President Peña Nieto. Uh, in that speech, he said, it's time to reform our legal immigration system in order to achieve the following goals to keep immigration levels measured by population share within historical norms, to select immigrants based on their likelihood of success in US society and their ability to be financially self-sufficient, to choose immigrants based on merit, skill, and proficiency, and to establish new immigration controls to ensure that open jobs are offered to American workers first. Now, having spent a lot of time looking at the 1965 Act. It sounds to me from that speech that what Donald Trump was actually talking about, if it were to be implemented, uh, is a revision or even a rejection of the 1965 Act. Uh, and to me, the key line there in his speech was his suggestion that we have, going forward, have immigration levels, quote, measured by population share within historical norms. Now, there's a couple of things he could have meant by that, and he didn't clarify, and you know, I'm not sure he wrote the speech, and I'm not sure that he really uh, could answer that question for us. But it has been interpreted by others you know, in different ways. One of the things, when, he's, when he talks about the historical norms, uh, the, going back to a population share uh, by historical norms, he could be using the, that term in a numerical sense. In other words, he could be talking about going back to uh, you know, the levels of immigration that we had in 1970 numerically, where only 4% of our immigrants uh, were, uh, only 4% of our population uh, were immigrants. Or he may have meant it in qualitative terms or ethnic terms, uh, where we are going back to a time when the vast majority of our immigrants were white and European. Uh, maybe that's what he meant by <coughs> historical norms. You know, the national origin quotas were very deliberately devised. The idea 
there was actually a formula behind them. The idea was to maintain the ethnic profile of the U.S. population as it was in 1890. So in 1890, you had X percent of the population were from Northern Europe, X percent from other parts of the world. The idea of the quotas was to keep that ethnic profile the same. Was that what he was talking about, going back to a time when we have our population distributed according to sort of pre-existing notions of what share of the population white people should be? Uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't explain, as I say. However, he did have this one line. He said that <clears throat> we should select immigrants <clears throat> based on their likelihood of success in U.S. society. Not in that particular line, he's not talking about the economy. He says, based on the likelihood of success in U.S. society. To me, that resonates with this argument from 1965 that we need to sort of pay attention to which immigrants can assimilate in U.S. society most easily. And then he suggests that native-born Americans are being shut out unfairly in a competition with Americans, with immigrants. That American workers are being shut out unfairly in a competition with immigrants. Uh, the question of the impact of immigrants on the U.S. labor force and the U.S. economy has been extensively studied and written about. I'm not an immigra immigration economist nor a labor economist, and I touch on that question only briefly in my book. My reading of the research leads me to think that it is possible that some immigrants, uh, especially those who come here without papers uh, and are willing to work at almost any job for almost any pay, do compete with low-income U.S. workers, especially minority workers. They may, in fact, take jobs away from low-income U.S. workers or lower the wages of those workers who have to compete with them. On the other hand, there's also a lot of research that the net effect of immigration on the U.S. economy is positive, that the contribution of immigrant workers actually results in more economic growth and therefore higher incomes for the working population as a whole. I don't get into a lot of depth uh, in this, as I say, because I'm not an economist. I'm actually more interested in the cultural issue issues associated with immigration because over these last 50 years, we've had this influx of immigrants coming from countries very different from the ones that were already represented here. Uh, they have not largely had that Western European heritage that other Americans have had. In many cases, they come from very different religious backgrounds. They come from different political environments. Many were fleeing war or persecution. They were acutely aware of how they stood out in this country, and in some cases, their natural reaction was to protect themselves by sticking together. The big question raised by their immigration experience was, would they make good Americans? Because for a long time, we, whether we recognized it or not, we tacitly considered ourselves a white Christian nation, even without really thinking about it. We have now had to adjust to the presence in our society of many people from other backgrounds. We've, we now recognize, at least in theory, that Koreans, Mexicans, Somalis, Egyptians, or Pakistanis can be Americans. To the extent that we think about or articulate what it means to be American, uh, we define our nationality more in political or ideological terms. It means embracing the ideas set down in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. There's a, a kind of a credo of individualism, self-reliance, enterprise, generosity. Maybe it means buying into the idea that America is an exceptional nation. This is what the post-1965 immigrants have been asked to understand and accept. And the rest of America has been asked to understand and accept the possibility of being fully American without being white, European, or Christian. These are the challenges that the 1965 Act has presented. My general feeling is that the post-1965 immigrants have proven to be good Americans and that America has proven to be, a, for the most part, a resilient, accommodating nation. Now, uh, I know some of you are, are wondering about that. I don't want to understate the tensions and the conflict that uh, this transformation has brought about. We've certainly seen evidence of that in this election to an extent that I personally find alarming. Uh, there's been a kind of an anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner reaction that I had hoped, you know, had sort of largely receded in this country. I don't know how many of you saw 
a very alarming story in the New York Times uh, last week about the Turkish immigrant who founded the Chobani uh, yogurt company, highly successful. Giovanni has annual sales of about $1.5 billion and employs 2,000 people. And this Turkish American entrepreneur has recently become known as an advocate for hiring immigrants, refugees in particular, and he's pushing other companies to follow his example and do the same. And of course, a lot of refugees these days are from Syria or from other Middle Eastern countries. A lot of them are Muslim. And as a result of his advocacy for refugees, this businessman has been subject to some truly horrifying, awful abuse. The animus toward Muslim immigrants or Muslim refugees, I fear, has been fueled in part by some of the rhetoric that we've heard coming out of the Trump campaign or people around him. So I'm not underestimating how difficult this transformation into a diverse country can be. But as I said, my general feeling is more positive, that America has proven to be a pretty resilient nation. And as I say, more so than many European countries. I, come, I came to this conclusion in good part through my in-depth look at one area in Northern Virginia, not far from where I live. Fairfax County in 1960 was still largely rural with closer ties to the rest of Virginia and to the South than to metropolitan DC. Population in 1960 was about 90% white. Uh, eight or 9% of the people in Fairfax County were African American, but they lived largely in segregated communities and attended segregated schools. The county authorities in 1960 were vigorously resisting integration. Just about one or 2% of the population was other, neither white nor black, uh, from largely immigrant backgrounds, but only one or 2%. Well, over the next 50 years, that county was dramatically transformed, largely by immigration. Today, about three out of 10 people in Fairfax County were born outside the United States. And if you include the children born in the United States but to immigrant parents, you're talking about more than 40% of the people in Fairfax County uh, with a close immigrant background. There are very few places in, in the country that have gone through more demographic change than Fairfax County. And it wasn't just immigration. As, as I say, there was first, it had to go through desegregation, which is itself a very traumatic experience for communities. And it went through urbanization, another traumatic experience for communities. Fairfax County is now very much a DC suburb with a booming population. But the county has done amazingly well. It has a population of more than one million, top-notch schools, a superior government, and one of the highest per capita incomes in the United States. It's an example of how a county can successfully accommodate a large new immigrant population and how immigrants themselves can find a productive and comfortable place in a new setting. I focus in my book in particular on three families, one from South Korea, one from Bolivia, and one from Libya. They are broadly representative of the post-1965 immigrant generation. And the question that I explored, as I say, I'm primarily interested in these cultural issues associated with immigration. The question that I explored most deeply in each of these three cases is what has it meant for them to become American? And what does America mean to them? I got different answers in each case. The, First uh, family, uh, a couple named Alex Young and Mark Keem. Alex was born in a farm in, to very poor parents in rural South Korea. Uh, through some distant relatives, her father heard about a program under which a chicken company was bringing Korean immigrants to the United States to work in a chicken slaughterhouse in Southern Maryland doing low wage jobs that no native born American workers would do. He jumped at the chance taking his family with them. They lived in a dormitory for the first few years. The mother and father both working long hours and saving every penny they could. Uh, Alex was just six when she moved here. She went on to graduate from high school with honors uh, and then to law school where she met Mark Keem, another young lawyer, also a Korean immigrant. Mark came to the United States with his family as a teenager, got interested in US politics largely because of Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, in which blacks and immigrants and other marginalized groups could join forces. He eventually went on to run for the Virginia State Legislature as the first Asian American immigrant, 
Uh, among those who contributed money to him was Alex's father, who was immensely proud that her Korean son-in-law was choosing a Korean US politics. Mark told me that his first understanding of what America stood for came through his study of the founding documents. For him, the notion of America is that it is an exemplary democracy. It's the political idea. The second family is the Alarcon family from Bolivia. Victor Alarcon represents the immigrant as entrepreneurs, as entrepreneur. He and his wife, Rina, didn't come from especially poor families. They weren't fleeing great war or poverty. Uh, Rina's uh, sister and Victor's brother saw no reason to leave Bolivia. Uh, so I think this is significant because what's the difference between Victor and his brother or between Rina and his sister? Some people seeing the situation in their home countries choose to stay. Some people seeing the situation in their countries choose to leave. Which are which? It's the ones who are willing to take a risk to seize an opportunity. Uh, so you're getting that segment of the population that is least risk averse, the ones most willing to take a chance, the most adventurous. Immigration itself is an entrepreneurial act. And Victor represents that phenomenon. I'm gonna sort of curtail his story, but what's interesting to me, he came here, started work as a dishwasher, discovered the Fairfax County Public Library, started going there every night to read books, how-to books. Going to the library and reading books, he learned how to repair cars, he learned how to repair air conditioning systems, he learned about computers, he went on and found work and eventually started his own businesses, and he says, Everything I learned, I learned from reading books in the Fairfax County Public Library. So for him, America is a place where anyone with initiative can make it. My final example is Isa Momish, who came here as a, from, as a teenager from Libya. Uh, uh, he, and although Libya is a Muslim country, his parents were not uh, overly religious. His mother did not uh, wear a hijab or headscarf. Uh, Islam didn't mean all that much to him. It was only while living in the United States that Islam <coughs> Omish discovered his Islam. And what's interesting to me about his story is that he didn't become in touch with his Islam and become a devout Muslim, which he now is, in reaction to how he was treated in the United States in the sense of it being a kind of a negative uh, and sort of wanting to embrace something that he was rejected for. It was the exact opposite. He found in the United States this climate of encouraging people to explore whatever it is that is meaningful to him. He went to Georgetown University, a Jesuit school, and there was a Catholic chaplain there who helped him start the Muslim Students Association at Georgetown University. And to him, the thing that distinguishes America more than anything else is its embrace, its support for religious freedom. Something he said did not exist in Libya and it's something he said he would not have found in Europe. So you've got three examples here of why these immigrants have come to attach themselves to the idea of America and find in each of their three cases something unique about this place that to them represents what America stands for. Uh, so again, in closing, the kind of transformation that this country is going through as a result of immigration will inevitably be challenging. Our resilience will continue to be tested. There will be new challenges. Do you know that in about 30 years, Muslim Americans will outnumber Jewish Americans in the United States? And as you know from this campaign, that's something that a lot of people are having trouble dealing with. Do you know this? This is something really important. Right now, in the United States, the toddler population is majority non-white. Most of the toddlers in this country are not white. And as we move through the years, of course that age is gonna be going up so that by 2040, the majority of our population will be not white. Diversity is our destiny in America. And regardless of who's elected president, regardless of what kind of controls or walls we wanna build, that is going to be the case going forward. And as I say, I sort of feel that we are capable of dealing with this, but no one should uh, think that it is going to be easy. That's my spiel. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Good morning. We, we have been given five more minutes for, for our discussion, and I, I have lots of questions from you, and I think that we're still able to gather a few more, so 
as you're thinking about things and warming up your brain, um, please please jot those questions down. So, so Tom, thank you so much for coming back to Minnesota. Uh, we met a little over a year ago. The National Book Festival. It, we are, and we were similarly talking on a panel about immigration. I think we were, I'll speak for myself, I was a lot more optimistic a year and a few months ago than I am today. A lot has changed in terms of immigration both nationally and, and internationally. I think certainly some of the, the signs were there with Trump's candidacy with some of the, the unrest and certainly the global migration crisis in Europe unfolding. But so much has happened um, with, uh, with Trump's nomination, the extreme immigration proposals that have been proposed over the year, um, as well as Brexit that have taken so many of us by surprise. So I actually wanted to, to step back, and I'm so glad that you, you read from the beginning of your book, um, which is here. That everyone should, everyone should, it's should pick up. Now too, so, it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually wanted to, to read a, a little bit of the prologue and then and then pose a question that I think will get to um, some of the contemporary issues as well as the global issues. So as you shared with us your your uh, your family history. Um, and then in, in the prologue you write, the experience of my own Norwegian relatives matched the idealized version of the immigrant story. America was indeed the place where their ambitions were limited only by their own talents, will, and discipline. For most of the world's population, however, the American immigrant promise was hollow. In reality, it was limited to people of the same color, skin color as my Scandinavian ancestors. And then it was only after 1965 that the United States unconditionally embraced its immigrant character and it did so unintentionally. You pose this question at the uh, very beginning of your book, which, which you um, also posed here, which is basically what kind of country uh, is America? How does immigration shape um, our country? Uh, how does immigration uh, test the United States and its character and identity? Will it be um, a nation that is formed by the teeming nations of nations, as Walt Whitman said, or are its achievements actually due to its Anglo-Saxon heritage? So you've just concluded your talk with a very optimistic note that it's not easy, it hasn't ever been easy, but America has shown its resilience and it has especially shown its resilience in the past 50 years with this new migration um, coming to the United States, increasingly diverse. So my question is to um, try and bridge some of that history with contemporary events, but also to help us think globally to get back at what uh, Tom Hansen's um, you know, wonderful presentation was. You have been traveling around the country um, this past year talking about immigration, past and present. You also cover world issues. Um, what lessons, both good and bad, can the U.S.'s most recent um, immigration history have for uh, what's going on in, in Europe, for example? Um, one where you see, as Tom's uh, um, slides showed, you, you have new borders uh, being erected, but you also have a new commitment towards uh, integration and adaptation. What, you know, how exceptional is the U.S. case um, what lessons might we draw from the U.S. example? Thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess I have to agree that in, I, my optimism of a year ago like yours has been tempered a little bit. But I think that there is, um, there's a couple of lessons that we can see even now in, in what's happened over the last year. One of them is there have been some uh, interesting data that have come out that show that the so-called ethnic nationalist uh, feelings uh, or white nationalist feelings are generally strongest in those areas that are most homogenous, where there actually is least con contact with an immigrant population. I talk about Fairfax County. There is almost no that I know of white supremacy movement in Fairfax County, even though it has gone from almost 0% immigrant to close to 40% immigrant in these years. Where you see it are in those areas where people don't have contact 
with immigrants, don't have contact with people from other backgrounds. And so I guess that is one reason that I would say that we still could be optimistic because the truth is that those areas are gonna have contact with immigrants of color in the years that come. And if what we have seen in the rest of the country holds true, the more contact they have, the more tolerant they're likely to become. I mean, you see this not only with respect to um, immigrants of color, uh, I, I did a story recently about attitudes toward LGD, LGBT people. And one of the things that has come out is that the more likely, you, you are more likely to be tolerant and understanding of LGBT people if you know someone who is themselves gay or if you have someone in your family who is gay. So I think that the lesson, you know, both respect to those issues and with respect to immigrants of color is that exposure and contact are kind of a leavening experience that you know, produces more tolerance. And you know, one of the differences between the United States and Europe is that we are a lot less ghettoized in terms of our integration of immigrant populations. I mean, in um, Fairfax County, you can't find, I actually talk about a place in Fairfax County that's called Koreatown, but the majority of the population in Koreatown are Hispanic. It's actually, a, it's actually a commercial center. It's not, it's not a residential center. There have been a lot of studies in Fairfax County that show how diverse it is. Diverse meaning the likelihood of people living next to people of other ethnicities. So even though you've got a huge Asian immigrant population, a huge Muslim population, obviously Hispanic population, they have not segregated themselves in neighborhoods. And that has been uh, the case in Europe. So uh, I think those are the reasons, some of the reasons why we can s retain some confidence about our ability to accommodate different, pe different populations. And I think in our next presentation by the Consul General, the, the differences between the U.S.'s identity of a nation of immigrants and Canada's tradition of multiculturalism will also um, be very helpful in considering how our national identities and experiences also shape the ways in which we approach and also value uh, diversity. Um, so I have one more question and then I'm gonna draw from, from the card. So this is your last chance to, to, um, to submit a question. And again, this is a question that, that uh, tries to connect some of the global contemporary uh, portrait that Tom Hansen presented to us and then your both um, earlier 20th century history and more, more recent history. So as we were reminded, human history is the history of migration. Yet there are these um, times when migration turns into a migration crisis. You talk about the 1920s and the debates over the national origins. You similarly talk about uh, the debates that led to the 1965 Immigration Act and, and Tom discussed some of the issues that are um, affecting this, um, this context today. Is it, um, so with that long historical perspective and your global um, experience in reporting, is it, is it purely economic? Is it purely um, a gap between, uh, the migration gap between the numbers of people who want to move and the available slots that are, um, that are open to them? Or are there larger, uh, global issues that we can point to to better understand how it is that this constant movement of people that we've that has formed our, our world can suddenly turn into a crisis where as Tom Hansen had said immigration is the thing that that's being blamed for all of these other issues well you know the the, the big phenomenon is globalization and it's not just globalization of the economy it's globalization of communication it's globalization of transportation uh, I mean, th I am amazed at the, you know, I encounter, when I was working on this book, I encountered a lot of uh, immigrants from Central America who were here without papers, who were living, you know, five or six to an apartment. Sometimes they have to share beds. Uh, I mean, they're just scraping by. Every one of them has a cell phone. And every one of them is in, and this is not an exaggeration, daily contact with their families back home. Because it is now so cheap, you know, through cards and so forth, they can sort of call for three or four minutes every single day back to their families in El Salvador. They can also, 
you know, I mean, if you're here without papers, it's a lot more complicated. But if you have legal status, being able to go back and forth is so much easier. When my grandfather came here and his uncles came here, it was a one-way trip. You did not come from Norway thinking you're going to go back like every couple of years. You were severing ties with your homeland and starting completely over again. That's just not the way it is anymore with migration because global transportation has become so much cheaper, so much more pr practical, so much easier, and global communication that we're, going to, we're just going to see this movement. Uh, movement is inevitable. I mean, you know, uh, for, a, for a long time there was very little migration from Africa to the United States. Uh, as I said, you know, there are only 100 visas a year, but believe it or not, those 100 visas were not actually fulfilled mm -hmm. for many years. Uh, you know, there were visas, even though there were only 100 visas a year for a country in Africa, many, many years those visas went uh, without takers because it was so extraordinarily difficult to migrate from Africa to the United States. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're just living in a different world. It's not just economic, it's not just war, it's not just violence, it's the convenience and the logic of migration that is so overwhelming now. Okay, um, I think there's still, if you have a card, you might wanna uh, raise your hand and, and we, we probably just have time for, for one or two questions. So I'm actually gonna start with this one because um, one of the things I do in the classroom, one of the very first things I do in the classroom is I um, tell my students, and I don't really give them any sort of rules or, or, or guidelines, but I tell them um, to take on the persona of an immigrant <laughs> refugee asylee and try to get into the country. How, you know, what rules apply today? Uh, does it matter whether you've got professional skills, what kind of skills, where are you from, if you have family, you know. Uh, and the, the idea is to um, instill in them the idea that, that immigration to the United States is very, very difficult and right. complicated. Right. So this question, I think, speaks to um, uh, some of the, the, the questions that many people have about how do people come to the United States. Uh, why can't our immigration policy apply some qualifiers to entry criteria, such as those who speak English, and have a skill set uh, we are lacking, i.e. doctors, tool, di tool and die workers, et cetera. This is not to shun those who are political or economic refugees, but balance those that need support services with those who don't. So how does the 1965 Immigration Act, how did the 1965 Immigration Act set up criteria for who can come in? Uh, that's a really interesting question. You know, when, when President Johnson first proposed this act, he said, as a nation of immigrants, we are able to ask, what can you do for our country? We should not ask, in what country were you born? Mm -hmm. His idea was that immigrants can be asked, what can you do for our country? Um, there was a fear that if we allowed into the country anybody that had a workable skill, we'd get, we'd get too many. So there was actually a move in Congress to take away that preference and instead make the top priority those people who already had relatives here. Family unification. Now, something like, you, you know this, Erica, I'm sure, is like 75 or 80 percent of immigrants who are coming into the country legally now are coming through this family unification provision. Believe it or not, the reason that that was originally put in there is the thought was that if you, only, if you gave preference to people who already had relatives here, you would get more of the same. There weren't that many Asians in America in 1965. There weren't that many Africans. So if you gave priority to people who had relatives here, you'd just get, in the words of one member of Congress, a naturally operating national origin system. Well, it backfired. That's the part that backfired because there was this tremendous desire to come here. And once you've made family unification the top priority, then all you needed to do is to get one person in the country via a student visa, an employment visa, that person was then entitled to bring in not only their children, not only their mother and father, but their brothers and sisters, and their, if their brothers and sisters were married, their brothers and sisters' wives, and their and husbands, spouses, and therefore the spouses' brothers and sisters. I tell a story in my book of a Pakistani man who came here on an employment visa in 1968, Within 20 years, he was personally responsible for more than 100 
people coming to this country. And so, in a sense, this backfired. The idea that by giving priority to relatives, you were going to get more of the same. Instead, you just really opened the gates. Now, actually, the question that this person raises is a really key one. If we ever get back to that point where immigration, comprehensive immigration reform will be considered by Congress, this is one of the questions that they're going to have to answer. Do we want to continue to have family unification as the top preference for immigrants, or do we want to move to a more skills-based, um, merit-based? Now, Canada. in Canada, you have a much more <laughs> merit and skill-based, right. education-based right. system. Mm -hmm. That was the original yes. idea of the 65 Act. Yes. It, was, it was thrown out in this kind of mistaken idea that, you know, we'd get too many immigrants that way. It actually backfired. And the, the Eric, another you should like fill in because you well, know this. No, stuff. no, no. Well, the, one of the backstories behind the family reunification clause and preference was the idea that it was mostly Europeans who would um, take, advantage. take advantage of it. So it was another way to tip the balance of our immigration system towards ethnic homo homogeneity with, with European Americans. The other aspect and Asian advocates were very upset about right, that. Right, right, the because they didn't think that there was the ability yeah. to come in. But the other aspect of the 65 Act is, um, is a preference category for professionals and um, skilled, uh, exceptional talent, ex uh, professionals and skilled workers and artists of exceptional talent. So there is a preference category for skilled workers. There is no line for unskilled workers to, to get into to come into the United States. So that the, the other side of the 65 Act is that we place restrictions on immigration from the Western Hemisphere for the first time. And, and that leads to the, the large-scale undocumented um, migration mm -hmm. that we've seen in recent decades. Mm -hmm. uh, is there time yeah. for one more question? And I think this is something that many of you are thinking about, so this is why I chose this one out of the rest of the pile. Um, how can Minnesotans as individuals and families organize and prepare to take on um, more refugees? What are the steps? <laughs> well, not, I mean, Minnesota is um, really on the front lines of this kind of, I, I wouldn't have expected it. I think of Minnesota as being a pretty homogenous sort of place. And as it turns out, it actually turns out to be on the front lines mm -hmm. of dealing with this, largely because first, in the first case, because of the Hmong mm -hmm. populations that moved here, and more recently, the Somalis and so forth. Uh, and, you know, you've had, I know from the Twin Cities, you've had a number of young Somalis who have gone off to join al-Shabaab and so forth. So it's not as though you're naive about some of the challenges, but I think that Minnesota with its great progressive tradition has also been a pace setter in reaching out and integrating uh, these communities. I've been out of Minnesota now for about 40 years, so I you know, have kind of lost touch. It should probably be Eric or somebody else who can talk about what's happening in Minnesota, but my impression from afar is that there's been a lot of generosity shown here to immigrants and many efforts, even in rural Minnesota, uh, to uh, integrate and to welcome uh, people from other backgrounds, right? We can definitely see both the, um, the promise and the progress that's been built over the 40 plus years of the most recent uh, refugee resettlement programs here in Minnesota, about 7% of the state is, is foreign born, and I know we'll have panels in the afternoon that will talk more specifically about demographics. Um, so again, there's, there's great success stories, um, but there's also still those tensions and the, those, um, those growing pains that, uh, that we, like many other communities in the United States, are experiencing. So I think that's all the time that we have for today. Yeah, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have right now. But I think Tom and Erica, you're going to be <laughs> Also, if I could say, um, the, ma <clears throat> the Making of Asia America by Erica Lee is the prime preeminent book on the history of Asian immigration to this country over the last 50 years. She's very modest. It's a ter terrific book.